defaults to if nobody says yes, fail and reject access. I have seen more than one operating system of various types where the distribution packager screwed up in some way and this allowed access. So there is a PAM module uh, called PAM Deny that is specifically for the purpose of saying no. You always, always want to end a, a chain of sufficients with something that explicitly says no. You may not enter. But sufficient lets you do some fun things. If you read through this, our, our first authentication method, the breathalyzer, is sufficient. If they pass the breathalyzer, authentication is permitted, rule processing stops, we're done. If that fails, though, we have a required and the and is sufficient. So, either the user must pass the breathalyzer or they must pass the DDR tablet and the gene scanner. So this allows, if not A, then both B and C. And there are, there are other ways to do this, but this is the, the simplest pure PAM method of doing it. You may also see reference to a binding control. It's a required control that stops the policy on success. I have not included an example because I have never seen an example in the wild. I asked around. I asked a lot of people. Nobody has seen this in the wild. Uh, this was something that was created when PAM was created and the architects thought this would be a great control to have. And then reality appeared and said, no, we don't care. This is nothing. So, realistically, the word binding in PAM means LDAP. Your config files can also have, can include other configuration files. This is a, uh, a Debian example, I believe, where they pull in this file system off, where they set all of their defaults. But then they've added a couple extra roles for this one particular service. So it, it lets you say everybody uses these defaults and then this particular service needs a little bit of extra. And some of the policies with PAM that you get for includes are very, very long. Debian, of course, uses their own special syntax for includes. <laughs> because that is how Debian rolls. Module flags. This shouldn't be rocket science to anyone here, but you can feed your modules optional flags that control and adjust behavior. This first one with the breathalyzer, if your blood alcohol level is 0.08 or more, you may not log in. I know some people where that needs to be greater than 0.08, but uh, and you know, gene scanner, we check to see if they're a Neanderthal. Neanderthals may not log in. Um, of course, you can't do this. Uh, that is racial discrimination, and that is not American, but Pam supports it. Now, there are some module flags that appear in a lot of places. Uh, the debug flag. Just about everything supports debug. And it will feed debugging information into the system log. No warn shuts up user feedback. Now, a couple that can bite people are, whoop, are these use first pass and try first pass options. 
try first pass means as you go down the policy, if a password has already been entered, reuse that password and see if it works. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, ask again for a password. Use first pass, on the other hand. That means check to see if a password has been entered, and if it has, always use that password. Don't give the user another chance. There's no flexibility here. Expose account is the uh, fancy way of saying spill lots of information to the user. Uh, you might use this for debugging or testing, but you wouldn't put this on in production. Um, you may see used mapped pass, which uh, involves hashing the password that's entered. If you're using that, read your manual very carefully. So, here is a, uh, this is a FreeBSD uh, system default login. Where if you, if, if you attempt to log into the system, the first thing we do is we check this PAM OP. OP is one-time passwords in everything. If OP works, that's sufficient. Log them in. Uh, this requisite statement for PAM OP access, well, if the system requires OP and you failed OP, get out. And then there's the, this required statement, PAM Unix. Since it's required, the user must pass this, or they do not get in. Similarly, here we have this two-statement account policy. First thing is required PAM login access. Is this the user's permitted login time? All of the traditional Unix checks. May this user log in? If you don't get that far, we don't even check the user's account. Just kick them out. Um, I'm sorry, no, it's required, not requisite. We do check the user's account. They're getting kicked out anyway. Um, the session, the only thing we do for a default is this PAM last log so that the, the attempt to log in or the login gets logged. And then we have special requirements for changing the password. So really common PAM modules you will see. PAM Unix is all of the interaction with Etsy password and the related files. In Linux PAM, PAM Unix actually configures the password file. This would let you do things like change password hashing, which for the record, don't do that. The people who set up your distribution have a lot more crypto knowledge than anyone in this room. Well, yeah, I'm pretty sure than anybody in this room. Uh, you use their defaults unless you have a really good reason. Uh, PAM wheel in Linux PAM or PAM group in Open PAM checks user group membership. The, the old, if a user is a member of this group, they may log in. Now, I, I will mention that uh, Linux PAM also has a PAM group module that does completely different functions, but shares a name with Open PAM because programmers hate sysadmins. <laughs> uh, PAM deny says no. Nope. PAM permit says yes. PAM secure TTY checks to see if this is a secure terminal. Are you logged onto the console? Is this a, a, you know, a physical VT100 over the serial line from the command center? Anything like that. PAM last log feeds the accounting system, and PAM no login checks Etsy no login. 
Okay, Linux PAM extended controls. How many have you how many of you have seen extended controls and wondered what was going on? Okay. The rest of you have probably seen them but don't know what they are. So PAM success means that things worked. All of the other PAM control PAM codes mean the request failed. And there are many different response codes. Linux PAM extended controls let you adjust how your policy responds to these other codes. An extended control is surrounded by square brackets and lists each of the individual codes. Something like this. This is a PAM extended control. Uh, if I recall correctly, that's a CentOS one. Either CentOS or Debian. Uh, in this case, it, we're looking at PAM secure TTY. If that module returns user unknown, we ignore the error. If it returns success, we say OK. If it returns ignore, PAM ignore, we ignore it. And our default answer is bad. We'll, we'll get to what each of those responses mean. But you could take all of the 30-ish PAM return codes and handcraft a custom response just for that return code to let you handle any conceivable situation that PAM can support. Um, an action bad means veto the request. The policy continues processing, but ultimately the policy says no. Uh, it's like a requ required control fails. And often bad is the default action. We want to set a couple of custom responses, but for most of them, we, we don't care. We just want to say no. Um, the die action is it votes no and stop voting. It's like a requisite control failed. We're done. We are taking the authentication request out behind the barn and shooting it in the head. The action okay. You'll also see a lot. And this module succeeded and says yes, so long as nobody else objects. And the policy keeps going. And done means this when this module succeeds, uh, or when, when you get this response code, say yes, and we are done voting. It's over. Mm -hmm. you, you may proceed. And ignore means abstain from the decision, don't vote. The module does its thing. Uh, you'll see this for supporting services. It's a lot like the optional control. And then you have these numbers, which means skip this many of the following rules. And Linux PAM uses this to implement conditional processing. Which gives you things like this. This is the Debian common authentication rule. Would anyone except Brian care to take a stab at what this means? S equals one means you skip the deny. So uh, if whatever uh, null OK is, or excuse me, if it, let's see, if it's not authenticated by the normal Unix one, or rather, if it is authenticated by the Unix one, then you go to check permit, uh, whatever permit is. Uh, if on the other hand they're not uh, in it, then you ignore it, which causes you to fail on the deny. So it's nonetheless. Yes. Yes, what happens here? I spent a while studying this. First thing we check is PAM Unix. We check the user's username and password. If, and 
At first glance, we check that first, and our second rule is PAM deny. PAM deny means no. And that's requisite, meaning voting stops. So the second rule in our chain says, no, voting is done. Nobody gets in. There, there is no question here. You're done. Get out. But with the PAM extended control, if you successfully authenticate, if you get PAM success from PAM Unix, you skip one rule, which takes you down to this required PAM permit. PAM permit always says yes. So we do this little shuffling dance to get to where it says yes. And we've specifically said yes after, if and only if, Pam Unix says yes. So, so you don't so, skip, you know, skip one by, well, how do you know skip one versus two? Because success, the one right there so says the one, skip one. So, so one means skip the number of lines. Yeah. Skip that many lines in the policy. Got it. So the first time I figured out what they were doing here, I, I kind of threw up a little in the back of my mouth. <laughs> and I've, I've come prepared. Um, Brian has some mints to hand out if you've had this problem. So help us out, Brian. Um, I, I believe that they do this because of Debian's automated PAM management tools. Because this way they can just add and remove statements to the bottom of the policy. But as a human being looking at this, I kind of go, what are you smoking? So, the reset action uh, in, a, in an extended control means Throw away everything that has happened before and start over. You could put a reset after a required to say, yes, that failed. But if we get this weird condition down here, throw it away and start over. Mm -hmm. Again, I have never seen this in production. It's yet another good idea that has very little place in reality. And of course, since this is being filmed on YouTube, I'm going to get about 300 emails that say, yes, we have to use Reset uh, for this system on the dark side of the moon that's running, you know, Sto Unix, and I'll say fine. Linux PAM also has this thing called Substacks. And include pulls a file in and uses it uh, within the main body of the policy. A substack runs a PAM policy separately. And when the substack finishes, either with success or with rejection, processing goes back to the main policy. And that main policy continues. So you'll see something like this. Uh, we start with a, a check of for a secure terminal. We then fall through into this substack, the system off substack, and then it would come back to this post log. Down here we have the substack. And we check for the environment. Uh, there's a PAM module for fingerprint checking. Uh, we check PAM Unix. There's an optional module here to check um, for UIDs, and it ends with a PAM denon. Um, so if we make it to here where it says PAM Unix sufficient, great, it's sufficient, we're done processing, head back to the main policy and include the post log. <coughs> if we make it all the way down to deny, and say, nope, no login for you, fine. Hop up to the main policy, include the post login stuff.
So, Linux PAM has a bunch of features that are not in other versions of PAM because Linux is younger. They needed a place to put some of these features that Solaris and BSD already had. So you'll have you know, PAM environment to configure the environment. PAM succeed if does conditional processing. PAM local user just checks to see if the user is local or if they're from LDAP. PAM limits is resource control and of course there is a PAM system D module that handles very specific system D stuff. Okay, that is the run through of how PAM works. But what a sysadmin really wants is how to debug this crap. Because you look at, the poli at a policy, maybe you've enabled a new PAM module, we'll do some of that, and you're wondering, why doesn't this work? I did everything. Why? Why? Well, start with the debug flag on a module. To the best of my knowledge, every well-programmed PAM module accepts the debug flag. If you have found a PAM module that looks useful for your environment, and you put the debug flag in, and the module barfs, and your system log fills with the module complaining about the debug flag, this should be a big warning that whoever programmed this really wasn't interested in debugging or errors or what happened when things go badly. And maybe you should look for a different module. Uh, Pan Echo is a useful module that as the chain, as the policy processes, it will feed things back to the user. And Pan Exec lets you run arbitrary commands with shared libraries inside your authentication chain. I see no way this could possibly go wrong. <laughs> And for my favorite error, as you're writing your policy or adding your module, did you put .so on the end of the module name? As I was working on the PAM book, it became very clear this is my most common mistake. So here's how you might use PAM Echo. I've gone into a, a FreeBSD authentication policy, and I've added these bold statements that say PAM echo, checking OB, checking OB access, checking Unix off. So when a user comes in, and here I've tried SU minus M, we see exactly where this policy goes. And you can, just like any other kind of debugging, printf is your friend. Where do we die? I would not use PAM echo in production. Your users will be confused. They will want to know who OP is and why is he working with the computer. How exact? Arbitrary commands inside your authentication libraries powerful stuff. I'm using this as a very simple logger for different parts of the policy. You never fixed that previous slide. Hush. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, there's a, uh, a typo. Hush, Brian. Do you want me to do the martial arts demo with you again? <laughs> So, I'm running this script, user local scripts, pam debug.sh, and feeding it the argument, pam op. And I add this to each part of the chain, and the script is really very simple. What is my environment? I grep for pam, I feed it to logger. And so I get 
my, my various PAM variables out of the policy as it's hitting each point. And so we can debug it. Let's look at some useful things we could do with it. How many of you have a Unix workstation? How many of you use SSH keys? <coughs> How many of you have a passphrase longer than one word? Most of you are good people. So, <clears throat> I have a routine with my Unix workstation. You wake up, you go to work, you enter your password, you, enter, you get in your environment, you enter your SSH key, you're ready to work. Now, for a lot of environments, for example, my workstation is now at home. Anyone who is in my house and has physical access to my Unix workstation and has the ability to decrypt my ZFS file system when it boots, I'm pretty much doomed. Uh, a password does not add another layer of protection. So I boot up the workstation in the morning and I use my SSH passphrase to log in, not a password. And this automatically loads my keys into my agent. So it takes one little annoyance out of the day. So now I would not do this on a shared system. I would not do this in my workstation at the office where there's other people around. You have to decide if this is a good fit for your environment. So. Everybody has a package for PAM SSH on. But they do different things with it. Anyone care to take a look at the FreeBSD rules for me and see what, what does this chain of rules do? You answered the last one. Let's, let's give someone else the chance. Yes, sir. Uh, so efficient is that after you end your password through SSH is, works, then it logs you in? Yep. And, uh, and if, if you happen to put your Unix password in, in the, it's going to fail the first one, not warn you, go to the second one, which will try first pass, Yes. and take it. So. So what happens? Do it either way. Yes. What happens here? If you enter your SSH passphrase first when prompted, that's sufficient. You get logged in, your key is loaded into your agent. If you don't successfully enter your passphrase, um, you know, if, if you've read a whole bunch of Neil Stevenson books and your passphrase is three paragraphs long, that happens, so it will fall through. The sufficient failed? Well, PAM Unix is required. But the PAM Unix module has this try first pass, which means it will recycle the password that you entered for PAM SSH, and if it works, great, you're in. If it doesn't, it'll ask you for a password. All well and good. Now here's what Debian <coughs> does with the exact same module. Sorry, it is not exactly the same. <laughs> uh, they, of course, have made some little changes, but the functionality is at its core the same. Anyone care to take a look at the Debian policy? and see what this does. So if you enter your Unix password, it's 
password goes ahead and um, goes down to the required of pan permit. Yep. And then to the optional. Yep. Um, if you don't type it in correctly, then it's it's going to go to requisite, right? Well, what happened? Yes. What happens here? We start off with Unix, not SSH. And 